afford to give more tax breaks to the wealthiest 2 percent. Mr. President, I yield the balance of my time. President, I yield the balance of my time and note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The senator from Louisiana is recognized. Madam President, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to dispense with a quorum call. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, as chair of the Small Business Committee in the Senate, I'm uh, pleased to come to the floor today to give some supporting remarks uh, for Senator Schumer's uh, small business um, tax reduction bill. Uh, the bill uh, will invest basically $20 billion to the bottom line of small businesses, uh, owners of businesses that are dynamic and that are growing. And I'd like to make that distinction. It's not all small business that will get a tax relief. It's small businesses that are dynamic and growing, adding employees or increasing wages. The bill is smartly and narrowly targeted to motivate and to reward those small businesses, a subgroup of the 28 million small businesses that exist in the country today, Madam President, many of whom are in your state, Minnesota, that has uh, some uh, very uh, high growth, high potential small business development in the medical field, I understand. In my state, it would be those businesses that are growing because of the increased demand for energy and the new technologies that are coming out not only for oil and gas production, uh, which is important, but also other sources of energy. In Ohio and, and Michigan, it could be those uh, small business suppliers that are rallying around the emerging uh, and strengthening automobile industry, which uh, President Obama and the Democrats, uh, Democratic uh, members of this Congress had so much to do in salvaging. Our bill is not just throwing money against the wind, it's taking precious taxpayer dollars and targeting it to those businesses that are growing. That's why, as the chair of the Small Business Committee, I want to strongly endorse Senator Schumer's proposal over the proposal that came from the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives bill basically is taking $40 billion that we don't have. We don't have the $20 billion either, but one is half the cost, taking the $40 billion and throwing it at businesses 50% of which, according to the CBO study, will accrue to the highest income earners in the country, over a million dollars. It is not targeted. It is just about business profits, which are important. I know that businesses are in business to make profits. I have no problem with that. We want our businesses to be profitable. But what our, the Schumer proposal relative to the Canada proposal is targeted to those businesses making a profit and reinvesting it in the business to grow. Hiring workers and putting this recession that we're gr coming out of uh, because of poor policies of previous administrations coming out of this recession to help grow the economy. So you can give tax cuts in a variety of different ways. If we had all the money in the world, maybe we could afford to do both. But we're not that fortunate, and we have to make choices. And that's what we do on the floor of this Senate every day. Make choices, make distinctions between wise ways to spend money and poor ways to spend money. I would suggest if we have $20 billion to spend, if everybody agrees that we have at least that, that the Schumer approach is much more efficient, will be much more effective, will get much more bang for the buck than the Cantor approach. So I want to commend uh, Senator Schumer for putting uh, his bill on the floor, uh, the Small Business Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. Um, according uh, to the National Economic Council, the tax credit would provide $20 billion in direct tax relief for businesses that hire new workers or increase wages and it could encourage an additional $200 to $300 billion in new wages and jobs this year. This tax credit, as I said, makes sense. It will help create jobs. According to the Congressional Budget Office report released last year, policies that have the largest effects on output and employment per dollar of cost in 2012 and 2013 are the ones that would reduce the marginal cost of hiring. CBO report from November of 2011, that's exactly 
what the Schumer bill does. Firms that make capital investments in 2012 would be allowed to deduct the full value of the investment on their 2012 return. We know that this kind of targeted tax cut can spark demand that small businesses have been clamoring for. This tax cut is an extension of a tax provision that expired in 2011 and had yielded an estimated $50 billion in added investments and lowered the cost, the average cost of capital for business investment by over 75 percent, according to the National Council of Economic Advisors. So we've had a lot of experience, Madam President, in the Small Business Committee and in the Finance Committee, which Senator Schumer serves on, in the last couple of years, designing and implementing tax cuts for the middle class, tax cuts for the job creators. Uh, and again, if you look just very objectively, considering the Schumer proposal cost half as much as the Cantor proposal, and will probably do three times, if not four times better, it really is a no-brainer which one is more effective, and that is the Schumer proposal. I hope as the senators come to the floor and begin to look more carefully at the Schumer proposal versus the proposal that came from the House, they will realize the benefit of the Schumer approach and give it the 60 votes we need to move it forward. Uh, and we'll reject the Cantor approach as being too expensive uh, relative to the other option that is on the table and much less effective. In the event, Madam President, that the Senate decides to do neither, which might happen uh, because there have been log jams around here for a while now, uh, which I was very proud of my colleagues Barbara Boxer and Jim Inhofe working together to break the log jams in a spectacular way just two weeks ago on the same floor when they finally negotiated a two-year transportation bill, the flood insurance bill, the Restore Act, and the student loan reduction bill, which is remarkable work that the Congress did uh, last week. In the event that the Cantor proposal fails and the Schumer proposal fails, I'm hoping to offer uh, an amendment that the leadership is considering now that was put together by um, the Snow staff and uh, Senator Snow and the Landrieu staff and, and myself over the course of the last several weeks. I'm not uh, uh, the only name on this right now is, is mine, but it's been put together by a variety of senators that have been working across the aisle for months now on items that are really important uh, to the small business um, community. Again, we have 28 million small businesses in America. 22 million of them are single uh, employee employers. In other words, they're self-employed professionals that are either doctors or lawyers or uh, landscape architects, architects, um, service, other service providers, uh, network uh, professionals, uh, IT professionals that are working in their own business. They employ themselves. Those are very valuable. We encourage entrepreneurship in America. And we may have more entrepreneurs per capita than any place in the world and we believe in it and we're excited. We also are excited for our businesses that start with two or three employees and before you know it they have 200 or 300 and then you close your eyes and open them again and they have 2,000. Very exciting. We call them the gazelles or we uh, look for accelerating opportunities. So this package uh, that we've put together uh, with, as I said, uh, the, the um, significant input of Senator Snow and her staff, along with input from Senator Kerry, who has been an extraordinary uh, leader in this way, Senator Merkley, uh, Senator Cardin, uh, and a list of other senators that I'm going to refer to have been working for years uh, on some of these issues, and I want to make sure that I give them the credit for these issues. First in our package is a very popular and very effective 
100% exclusion of capital gains for investments in small business. It was in the small business tax extenders package. President Obama has recommended this, and Senator Kerry is the lead uh, sponsor, along with uh, Senator Snow on the Finance Committee. Uh, this would, um, let me just by way of background, until 2009, non-corporate taxpayers were allowed to exclude 50% of the gain from the sale of stock of a qualified small business if taxpayers held the stock for five years. The Recovery Act increased the 50% to 75%, and the Small Business Act of 2010 subsequently increased it to 100%. But as of January of this year, it was reverted down to 50%, and startup investments are no longer entitled to the preferred capital gain treatment. Our uh, proposal uh, would basically take this up to 100% exclusion from the sale uh, of capital gains that non-corporate taxpayers purchased in 2012 and 13 and hold for five years. Um, it has bipartisan support. As I said, Senator Kerry has been the lead advocate. Uh, Senator Snow has worked side by side with him. Uh, and Senator Morin, Senator Warner, Senator Coons, and Senator Rubio have all called for this provision, uh, making it permanent. Now, I wish we could make it permanent. This bill will not, uh, we will not make it permanent in the Landrieu Amendment, but we will extend it for another year and a half. And according to the Kauffman Foundation paper published earlier this year, and the Kauffman Foundation, for those that don't know, is really the leading think tank. It's not political at all. It is just a middle of the road, really most uh, well-respected think tank on small business development. They published a paper earlier this year. The 100% exclusion boosts the after-tax returns on such investments in startups and should induce substantial levels of new investments in startup firms. They further estimate that by making this provision permanent would um, uh, increase uh, investments conservatively by 50% more than the overall cost of the provision. So they are supporting the, um, this provision very strongly and would like to see it permanent, but we can only afford in this package uh, to have it for a year, the next year, as we again build out of this um, recession. Let me say, the, uh, I guess from a conservative point of view, one of the good things about this provision, after we vote on the Schumer proposal and the Cantor proposal, only scores at $4 billion. So we get a tremendous benefit for a very small investment of taxpayer money, relatively speaking. Not that $4 billion is chump change, but compared to the $20 billion that we're considering for the Schumer package and the $40 billion from the Cantor package, we think that we take that $4 billion and, like yeast, you know, really make it stretch and grow uh, to affect a lot of people and to spur a lot of investment. The next provision um, is the uh, small business tax extenders, the increased deduction for startup expenditures. Again, uh, this has been a Snow and, and Merkley uh, initiative. I think um, uh, Senator Merkley has really uh, uh, stood up uh, to fight for this. Under current law, taxpayers can elect to deduct up to $5,000 of startup expenditures in the taxable year in which they start a trade or business. The 5,000 is reduced, but no uh, below zero by the amount by which the startup costs exceed 50,000. Examples are studies of potential markets, products, labor markets, or transportation systems, advertisements for the opening of a new business, et cetera, et cetera. Compensation for consultants that help you get your business started up. The Small Business Jobs Act temporarily increased the amount of a startup expenditure uh, could deduct from their taxes from 5,000 to 10,000 with a phase-out threshold of 60,000. Senator Merkley fought to have this provision in the Small Business Act. The proposal has been repeatedly endorsed by the National Association for the Self-Employed, National Federation of Independent Businesses, and as part of the Startup America legislative agenda, President Obama has called for making this permanent. Again, my amendment doesn't make it permanent, but it does uh, make it um, effective. Uh, through 2013. 
According to the Kauffman Foundation, on average, new firms inject about 80,000 into their businesses during the first year of operation. The vast majority of small business owners be, uh, invest between 80 and 90 percent, also invest significant amounts of their own money. Mr. President, let me underscore this. The way this amendment came together is we conducted in the Small Business Committee and had very good turnout, about three or four um, high-level hearings, well, excuse me, not hearings, but roundtables, where instead of having just two or three people testify, we had 20 people at a roundtable show up. And for two hours, in a very informal setting, they were answering questions. What is the best thing that we could do to help you now? What are the barriers to growth? Uh, what, is, uh, what, are the healthy, what does a healthy ecosystem for small business look like, and what could we do to strengthen and make healthier that ecosystem in America? That's where these ideas came from. And Senator Merkley, of course, picked up on, on some of this and understood the Kauffman Foundation was there. They said that even though I've talked a lot on the floor about small business needing to borrow money, and many do, when you start up a company, you really don't want to borrow money unless you absolutely have to because the chances of it not working are pretty significant. Most of new startups fail, as you know, Madam President, and so people do not really want to go into debt unless they have to or unless they're a little bit more sure that their idea is going to work. And so the benefit of this proposal is that you're actually rewarding the risk takers that are digging into their savings, that are taking second mortgages out on their homes, that are putting some of their other savings at risk behind their idea. What we're saying is if you do that, we will give you a significant tax break, considering it cost about $88,000 to you know, start on average a business. So this is really targeted to those risk takers. It's not just taking money out of the Treasury and throwing it at all small business. It's taking what little money we think, and this is only $4 billion totally, and saying, okay, let's really, really target it to those individuals that are putting their um, life on the line, they're putting their livelihood on the line, they're putting their future on the line, what can we do to support them? I am a really big believer in this provision and I thank Senator Merkley uh, for bringing it uh, to us. I see that Senator Casey um, is on the floor to speak and also Senator Shaheen uh, and that my time um, under a sort of informal agreement uh, has expired. And so, Madam President, since I'm going to be here on the floor most of the afternoon explaining uh, this amendment, I would be uh, happy to yield the floor and I see Senator Sessions here and ask unanimous consent that Senator Casey could speak for 10 minutes, Senator Sessions the next uh, five or 10 minutes, and Senator Shaheen for, for five minutes. Is that acceptable uh, to everyone? Is there objection? Ten minutes, Madam President, if you make that ten minutes, um, I think that will be fine. Okay, I would amend my to ten minutes each in the order Senator Casey, Senator Sessions, and then Senator Shaheen. Without objection, so ordered. Madam President. The Senator from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. I want to first of all commend the work of the Senator from Louisiana, the senior Senator, for her work on this legislation, but for her, her uh, many years laboring in the vineyard, so to speak, on small business issues and job creation strategies to help our small business uh, owners across the United States. I rise to speak about this legislation as well because when I go to Pennsylvania and travel across our state, I get two basic messages from the people of our state, and they're very clear about this. They, they say two things. Work on, on job creation, uh, put your time into uh, putting in place ways to create and incentivize the creation of jobs. That's the first message. The second message is work together. Get things done. Work with people in both parties to move forward a strategy to create jobs. And I think this legislation uh, does both. It's, um, it's focused on uh, creating jobs, especially as it relates to our small business owners uh, and their workers and their, their communities, but it also 
is a way to bring Democrats and Republicans together uh, to create jobs. The, the Small Business Jobs and Tax Relief Act will indeed help small businesses hire people by reducing the cost to small firms of bringing on a new worker or increasing their hours or pay. The economics of this are clear and compelling. By providing small businesses with new incentives to hire, we can create jobs and bolster economic recovery. Small businesses are at the center of the economy of the United States and are vital to our recovery. I know in Pennsylvania that there are nearly 250,000 small businesses. Four out of every five firms in the state uh, is, in fact, a small business. This legislation is common sense legislation, and I hope we'll have strong bipartisan support when we, have, uh, when we vote on the bill itself. It includes a business payroll tax incentive, similar to legislation I introduced back in the year 2010, that will make it easier for small businesses to grow and to encourage economic growth throughout the country. It will give businesses a 10 percent uh, income tax credit on new payroll for hiring new workers or increasing employee wages. It is, in fact, targeted legislation. It's targeted to small uh, business owners it's because it's capped at $500,000 per firm, or 10 percent of a payroll increase of $5 million. In addition to being targeted, it's timely. It will be available immediately for any new hires or increased wages for the remainder of this year, 2012. And thirdly, it's very effective. The Congressional Budget Office, as we know around here by the acronym CBO, uh, said that a tax credit based on increased payroll would create the most jobs and have the greatest positive impact on America's gross domestic product when compared to other job creation policies that have been uh, proposed. Under this legislation, small businesses that hire a new worker would, on average, see more than $4,000 in tax savings per worker hired. That's a substantial help uh, to a small firm, and you can just do the math as you hire more than one person. That's a smart step in the right direction to help these businesses uh, themselves and also to boost job creation throughout uh, our country. As the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, um, our committee just produced a report recently. I know you can't see the, all the lettering on this, this report I, I'm holding, but it's a very simple report, just a couple of pages, where it, it outlines in very uh, clear fashion the impact that small businesses have on our economy in terms of the predominance of small businesses when you consider uh, businesses across the board. The name of the report is, is uh, Tax Incentives for Small Business Hiring and Investment Strengthening the Backbone of the Economy. In fact, that's the truth. The backbone of the American economy is uh, our small business sector. The report finds that enacting a tax credit for businesses that hire additional workers or increase the hours and wages of existing employees will help both sustain and accelerate the recovery. Across the nation, 79 percent of business establishments are either single establishment businesses with fewer than 100 employees or are parts of multi-establishment companies with total employment under uh, 100 employees. Small businesses are, are, are responsible for uh, more hiring in the U.S. than any, uh, th than I should say, medium-sized or large businesses. As the labor market has begun to recover, small businesses have led the way again and again. If you look at the time period February 2010 to February 2012, small establishments were responsible for 46 percent of the hires versus 34 percent for medium-sized businesses and 20 percent for uh, large establishments. This is a critical point. Small firms accounted for nearly half of the hiring from early 2010 to early 2012. Small businesses truly are the engine that powers our economy. The recent monthly unemployment reports, which show uh, job growth at a slower pace than earlier in the year, underscore the need to provide new incentives uh, to hire and invest in businesses. 
Many small firms want to hire more workers, and they also want to increase hours, and this legislation will help them do that. In addition to the payroll tax credit, the legislation would extend the 100 percent depreciation deduction for major purchases through the end of 2012, so that businesses who want to make a big investment, a new building, a new significant piece of equipment, can get the benefit of that uh, this year. An extension of this uh, business expensing would reduce the cost of investment and promote economic growth. So in summary, Madam President, the Small Business Jobs and Tax Relief Act would help create jobs and strengthen the economy and move our recovery forward. These are objectives we all share, and I hope we can move forward in a bipartisan manner to pass this legislation, because in the end, it meets that two-part test that uh, my constituents give to me every day, which is they want me to do everything I can to help create jobs, and they want me to do it in a bipartisan way. This legislation, in fact, does this. Madam President, I would yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Alabama is recognized. Madam President, this afternoon the House of Representatives voted 244 to 185 to repeal the health care bill, the Affordable Care Act. Um, it was a bipartisan vote. A number of Democrats voted for it. Um, not as many as last time because a lot of the Democrats, uh, even those who voted against it, against it, got shellacked in the last election. And it was a uh, pretty rough, intense debate. The American people never felt comfortable with this legislation. And I believe it will be repealed. I do not believe it will be implemented. And the reason is, whether you like it or not, we don't have the money. We do not have the money, and I want to talk about that. I, the ranking Republican on the Budget Committee, and would share some thoughts uh, today with, for my colleagues as we wrestle with uh, what to do and how to get out of the legislation that passed by the narrowest single margin in, on Christmas Eve based on false accounting uh, in this Senate. President Obama promised before a joint session of Congress uh, in 2009 to spend $900 billion over 10 years on the law. He said, quote, now add it all up, and the plan I'm proposing will cost around $900 billion over 10 years. That's a lot of money, $900 billion. It's twice the defense budget almost. Uh, and he actually went on to say, and his supporters did, that it would reduce the debt of the United States. We're going to add all these new people and we're going to uh, pay for itself and reduce the debt. No one really believed that, but that's what the arguments were and the representations were made. But once you add up all the different spending provisions in the health care law, including closing the donut hole, uh, that's the prescription drug uh, area uh, that, uh, uh, did not, that uh, was not funded, implementation cost of the health care reform, including all those IRS agents and other spending in the bill, the total gross spending in the 2010-2019 period, the first 10 years uh, that he was proposing the bill would pass, was truly $1.4 trillion. Now I'll just show this on the chart because uh, it, it's very important. So the President promised in the State of the Union, to the American people, it would cost $900 billion. People knew it would cost some more, but even then, the first 10 years, as he proposed, uh, when you count the other factors, the uh, enforcement mechanism through the IRS agents, through the uh, uh, donut hole fix and other matters, it truly was $1.4 trillion over 10 years. That's almost a 50% more, right there. That's undisputable, I think. I'll ask my colleagues if I'm wrong, come tell me. Uh, and I would just note parenthetically, one of the most important things to have health care reform would include fixing the doc fix. In other words, we're projected without legislation uh, that takes effect to reduce the expenditures 
the payments to doctors by 20 some odd percent uh, for Medicare and Medicaid patients. That's what we would reduce the pay for if we don't do something each year. It adds up to about 200 to 250 billion dollars over 10 years. It was part of the promise that would be fixed in the bill. But when they looked at their numbers, if you paid for the doc fix, which was critical and needs to be fixed permanently, not continuing to hang out there every year and to be fixed by borrowed money, uh, if we fixed it, the bill wouldn't have, couldn't have been contended to be in surplus. In fact, it couldn't contend to be paid for, as the president was, was uh, uh, saying. And, and so they just didn't do it. They just decided they wouldn't uh, fix one of the most important areas in health care, and, and it remains that today. So we're using the Congressional Budget Office nonpartisan numbers. And, and as I work through this, most of the major spending provisions in the law, as our colleagues should know, do not take effect until 2014. So when the law is implemented, the 10-year score should be 2014 through 2023. That's the 10-year window of full implementation. And how much will the bill cost then? Each year it goes up because until 2014, you don't really get the full cost of the legislation. So what they did was, and the president deliberately did with aid from his OMB director, Mr. Peter Orzog, who was at CBO, and they contended that uh, this is going to be fine. They would do the first 10 years, and only six of them would have the real expenditures in the bill. And they would score it over 10 and say it only cost $900 billion. Well, that was not correct. So you, you look at this from uh, 2014 uh, uh, through 2023, each year, these, these red lines represent uh, a situation in which you're closer and closer to full implementation and how much the cost would be. And when you go to 2023, uh, 2014, the next 10 years, when the bill is fully implemented, it would cost $2.6 trillion, $2,300 billion, three times almost, uh, almost three times the estimated cost of the legislation. So people ask, how do we get in a situation where we are borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend? This kind of math. It's not correct. A, CB, a, a CEO uh, and a court of law would go to jail if he proposed that kind of uh, numbers to the uh, uh, court as his business practice and asking people to invest in their stock. Analysis by my staff on the budget committee uh, based on the estimates and growth rates that the Congressional Budget Office utilizes finds that the total spending under the law, that's including the other spending not directly related to coverage provisions, will amount to at least $2.6 trillion and could be much more. Now, how, how did they get this happen. It's, it's really um, a sad state of affairs, frankly. The Obama administration, Mr. Orzog and his Office of Management and Budget Director that works directly for the President, they, they asserted that this health care bill, uh, that about it, that health care reform is entitlement reform. In other words, this is going to fix our entitlement danger, the problems we have with uh, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid, entitlement programs, each one of which are growing at fast rates that are unsustainable, that will head to bankruptcy in the years to come. However, a simple comparison of the federal government's unfunded obligations for health care programs before and after the health care law was enacted clearly proves that the president's health care reform is not entitlement reform. It will not fix our deficit course. It will not make these programs sustainable. 
It did not put Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid on a sustainable basis. Those programs remain disastrously unsustainable. And the president won't even talk about that. Here we are running into a re-election campaign, and the country is facing a colossal financial danger from unsustainable debt, and the president won't even talk about it. He says things are getting along fine. I think it's a failure of leadership for him not to talk honestly with the American people about our challenges. So before the president's law, a health care law was enacted, unfunded ob obligations for the federal health care programs totaled $65 trillion over the 75-year period. That's how much we are going to run short in money to pay for the obligations that we have incurred on the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and some other programs, but those are the big three. Uh, after the recent passage of this health care bill, however, the uh, figure, according to the Congressional Budget Office, has gone up to $82 trillion. The difference in the two numbers is the President's health care law Madam President, I would ask for two additional minutes. You know, is there consent. objection? Without objection, so ordered. So the difference in the two numbers is uh, what has been added to the unfunded liabilities of the United States. By the way, 17 trillion is two and a half times the unfunded liabilities of Social Security, which is seven trillion. So, if my colleagues think I'm in error about any of these numbers, I hope they would correct me. Uh, perhaps I am. But we've worked hard to be accurate about them, and I don't believe I'm off in any substantial degree. The bottom line is this. We cannot afford this law and the additional burden that it places on our finances. We must repeal this health care law in its entirety and replace it with the kind of reforms that improve both our finances and the health care cost of Americans, not driving up their cost. This bill, whether you like it or not, will not be implemented. We don't have the money. At the time, this time of high unemployment, no growth, it will be hard to do the things that are necessary, that we have to do. Fix Social Security. Fix Medicare. Provide for the common defense. Those things have got to be done. We have no money to pay for a $2.6 trillion program over a 10-year period. We, we, we've got to save these programs that we're committed to first. The Medicare program won't be fully implemented until 2014. It's not too late to stop it now, and we're going to have to. Uh, Madam President, simply because the finances of this country will not allow for it. I thank the Chair and would yield the floor. Thank you. Madam President. The Senator from New Hampshire is recognized. Thank you, Madam President. I I'm pleased to come to the floor this afternoon to join my colleagues, Senator Landrieu and Senator Casey, in talking about the importance of addressing some of the concerns that face small business. And Senator Casey said something that I think is very important. He said when he goes around Pennsylvania, one of the things that he hears from his constituents is that they expect us to work together here in Washington, in the Senate, in Congress, to get things done for the people of this country. I hear that from my constituents. I'm sure the presiding officer hears that from her constituents. People throughout the country expect us to work together, and they want to see us address the economic challenges that we're fa facing in the country. Well, one of the best ways to address um, the fiscal issues that we're facing is to be able to grow this economy. And nothing is more important to growing the economy, to creating jobs, than small businesses. Um, Senator Casey talked about the recent report that came out from his 
Congressional Committee talking about the importance of small business. The fact is that over the last decade, businesses with fewer than 250 employees accounted for nearly 80% of all new hires. Economists tell us that about two-thirds of the jobs that are going to be needed to get us out of this recession are going to come from small businesses. And in New Hampshire, small businesses are particularly important. We are a small business state. Over 95% of all New Hampshire companies have fewer than 500 employees. About 85% of New Hampshire companies have fewer than 20 employees. And one of the things that we've got to look at is how we can help those small businesses continue to grow. Yesterday afternoon, I met with a group of small business owners from New Hampshire. They were all owners of construction companies. The construction industry in New Hampshire has been one of those industries that's been hardest hit in our state. And these businesses still need help. These business owners need help if they're going to be able to keep their businesses prospering and create jobs. The legislation that's before us on the floor, the Small Business Jobs and Tax Relief Act, will help these small businesses. The Lander Amendment that I want to speak specifically to, I think, is critical as we look at how we can provide additional help to these small businesses. And I want to talk specifically to two provisions that are in the Landrieu Amendment, also known as the Success Act. Um, the first one would deal with export issues. Um, one of the things that I have learned as I've been working with business and looking at how we can improve our economy and help create jobs is that Giving those small businesses access to international markets is critical. What we know is that about 95% of export markets are outside of the United States, and yet only 1% of our small and medium-sized businesses actually export. And so what we've got to do is help in every way we can through our policies, give them access to those international markets. Senator Ayotte and I both serve on the Small Business Committee. We represent New Hampshire, and last year we held a field hearing in New Hampshire, and we heard from small businesses in our state about what, what we could do here in Washington that might help them export. And as the result of what we heard, we've introduced some standalone legislation. But Provisions in that standalone legislation have been incorporated into uh, the Success Act, the amendment that Senator Lander is going to be offering. And those provisions would do a couple of things for our small businesses. One, they would improve government-wide export promotion. Right now we have a lot of independent silos, independent efforts that exist in different agencies to help small business with exporting. What we want to do is provide more coordination among those independent programs. It would also increase state events that are targeted to help small businesses export. Um, both are provisions that we heard from our small businesses in New Hampshire are important to them as they think about what they can do to improve their chances of exporting, getting into those international markets, and the jobs that can be created as the result of that. So that's one of the provisions in the Landrieu Amendment, the Success Act, that I think is very important. And Senator Ayotte and I and our staffs have worked very hard on this. Another provision that, again, is from standalone legislation that was introduced by Senator Landrieu, Senator Snow, Senator Isaacson, and myself, so it's also bipartisan legislation, would extend the 504 refinancing program through the Small Business Administration. You know, as I go around New Hampshire, one of the things that I still hear from, my, from the small businesses in my state is that they're still having challenges accessing credit. Well, extending the 504 um, refinancing program is, to me, a no-brainer as we think about how we can give those small businesses 
access to credit. What these provisions would do is extend for a year and a half the ability for the Small Business Administration to continue refinancing short-term commercial real estate debt into long-term fixed rate loans, again, through the existing 504 loan program, something that makes eminent sense, something that we ought to do. So those are two provisions that I've worked on specifically with other members of this body. They're provisions that are bipartisan. I think they have a lot of support. If we can get this amendment to the floor, I think there will be a lot of support for it. And it reflects all of the provisions of this Success Act that Senator Landrieu has been putting together. Again, I want to end with where I started. And that is that the people of New Hampshire and the people of this country expect us to work together to address the issues facing the country. Nowhere is that more important than in what we need to do to help create jobs and helping small businesses uh, to have the support they need so they can create the jobs that are going to get us out of this recession, um, provide long-term help to those people who are unemployed is absolutely critical. This legislation would help do that. Um, I hope that our colleagues, when it comes to the floor, will decide that this is one more way we can help small businesses create jobs and grow this economy. And I want to thank Senator Landrieu for her leadership, Ranking Member Snow on the Small Business Committee for her leadership, and hope that we can move this forward this week. President. The Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to uh, thank uh, my, our colleague from New Hampshire for not only being such an aggressive and, um, and fine and thoughtful member of the Small Business Committee, but for her constant encouragement uh, to me and to Senator Snow to really try to pull together some of the ideas that we all can agree on and move forward. It may not be the most perfect package. It may not be the most extensive package. But as the senator from New Hampshire said, it's a package that most all of us can agree to. And it has a price tag of only $4 billion. Now, that is a lot of money. But compared to the Republican proposal that has come over here from the House at $40 billion, and the Schumer proposal, which I support because it's much more targeted and much more responsible at $20 billion, this $4 billion amendment uh, could have a tremendous bang, a tremendous leveraging power for its cost. And the two proposals that Senator Shaheen explained beautifully actually have zero cost because the 504 program is a program that pays for itself and all we're doing is extending its authorization so people, and there are thousands of them in Louisiana, in Rhode Island, in New Hampshire, and other states that are caught paying higher interest rates on short-term loans for commercial buildings, and I'm sure we all know someone in that category, can now, if this amendment passes, go to their local bank. It's a government, it's not a government program, it's a partnership with the local banks and through the SBA and refinance uh, their uh, building uh, and get a longer term loan. In fact, I'm told, Mr. President, that this program, this 504 program, is basically taking up the majority of the space in this lending. That still the lenders are very weak. They're not extending credit out uh, in a long fixed rate. They're lending short term, they're lending with adjustable rates, and as you know and many others, when a person's starting a small business and taking so much risk, one risk that can be eliminated is uh, the cost of their money. And it's very comforting to a small business owner uh, who has to borrow, who doesn't have the savings or has run through their savings or their equity in their home and they've got to extend and take that risk uh, to be able to have a fixed longer term rate. So again, this proposal came from Senator Isaacson, who truly is acknowledged as the expert 
uh, in this entire chamber on commercial real estate and on residential real estate. He is known and respected on both sides of the aisle. This is his proposal with Senator Shaheen, and I want to thank him for his leadership. Um, also, the senator spoke about the export coordination. And again, zero cost, just smarter government at no cost. We need more of that around here. Smarter government, less spending. And that is what Senator uh, Shaheen's proposal uh, does, which is a portion of the, this amendment, the Small Business Export Growth Act. Let me reiterate that 95% of the world's customers are located outside of the borders of the United States. This might be shocking to people in America to realize this, but we represent only 4 to 5% of the population of the earth. We think of ourselves as the biggest and the best, and we are the best. We're not necessarily the biggest when it comes to population, though. And so there are growing markets all over the world. 95% of our customers and a majority of the market are outside of the boundaries of the United States. And what we are recognizing is right now only 1% of the 28 million small businesses in America export. Why would that be? One, it can be intimidating for a small business, even though they have a great product, they have a great idea, they have great technology. And, and India needs that technology, or Africa, some countries in Africa might absolutely want that product or that service. The small businesses are intimidated, they don't have the accountants, they don't normally have access to high-powered, expensive lawyers and, you know, and, and trade um, uh, executives and experts. So that is what our government and frankly state governments are doing this. Smart government, smart governments at the state level, whether it's California, Oregon, uh, Louisiana, all states are now recognizing, geez, you know, we really need to get behind our small businesses in our state and help them to export. I was very proud to put a substantial investment in the Small Business Act of uh, 2000, the Jobs Act of 2010, which gave grants, competitive grants out to states, and it's remarkable, just a little bit of investment at the federal level is leveraging a tremendous amount of excitement at the state and local level as those governments accept those grants and then put them to work, and in Louisiana, our uh, Department of Economic Development has been very aggressive using its STEP grants. So again, this is not an additional grant program. This Shaheen uh, proposal and IAT proposal has no cost. It's just a, it's, it's perfecting, coordinating uh, these, um, uh, this export initiative by establishing an interagency task force between the SBA, the USDA, and the XM Bank. It's really encouraging cooperation that now is not existing at the federal level and requires the SBA in coordination with other agencies to conduct one outreach event in each state per year, which I think would really help to motivate our state governments and our uh, uh, stakeholders at the state level uh, to be helpful. So let me um, go back to the beginning we have the Success Act um, amendments. I talked uh, earlier, uh, there are about 16 provisions in this amendment. We talked about the 100% exclusion of capital gains. We've talked about the increased deduction for startup expenditures, which is um, Senator Merkley's provision. Now I want to talk about the S-Corp holding period. Uh, this has come out of the Finance Committee, Senator Snow and Senator Cardin have been very strong advocates of this provision. Under current law, when a corporation becomes an S corporation, and there are, of course, benefits for becoming that kind of corporation, it's required right now to hold its business assets for 10 years or pay punitive taxes. This 10-year holding period, in our mind, is too long. It ties up assets that could be sold to raise capital. In 2010, in our small business bill, we reduced this holding period to five years uh, to have businesses better be able to manage their planning cycles. So this proposal is to extend the five-year holding period through 2012 and 2013. You know, potentially, if we could afford it, we'd like to make this proposal permanent. 
but in the Landrieu um, Success Act Amendment, it would uh, extend it through 2012 and 2013 and has a minimum cost. The next provision is the carryback provision, uh, up to five years of general uh, business credit card. This is really a proposal that Senator Snow feels very strongly about. Uh, the proposal would extend the carryback period from one year to five years for general business uh, credits earned in 2012 and 13. It would provide tax refunds to businesses that were previously healthy but are currently running losses. The proposal would improve the effectiveness of business credits that are ex intended to expand investment and employment. The provision would allow businesses greater immediate benefit from credits designed to encourage specific types of activity. And by providing businesses with greater opportunity to claim business credits, the provision would also give an infusion of cash to businesses which might promote investment. So that is another provision of um, of our Success Act. The Section 179 is probably the most popular part of our amendment. And again, Senator Snow has championed this in the Finance Committee, and many finance members are completely aware of Section uh, 179 in the tax code, which deals with expensing that many restaurants and retailers, and basically it provides a credit for them if a small business buys machinery and equipment or property contained in or attached to a building other than structural components such as refrigerators, grocery store counters, office equipment, gasoline storage tanks, uh, pumps at retail service stations, even livestock including horses, cattle, horses, sheep and goats, other fur bearing animals, all of these are equipment or products or purchases that small businesses make uh, to run uh, their businesses. This would allow a, um, an immediate write-off up to $500,000 for this kind of property. So again, it's a $2.3 billion over 10 years. It's the most expensive part of this whole uh, amendment, but we think it's $2 billion well invested to encourage uh, those small businesses to make these investments now to get um, uh, jobs and expansion opportunities underway. The uh, 26 national business groups such as the NFIB, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Home Builders, the National Association of the Self-Employed have endorsed this and uh, have sent a letter uh, to us with um, very enthusiastic support. The next section is uh, expanding access to capital for um, entrepreneurs. Uh, Mr. President, this was actually mentioned in President Obama's State of the Union message to us when he talked about his small business proposals. He outlined maybe a half a dozen things, a few of which we've implemented and a few of which we have not yet implemented. This was on his bucket list, uh, if you will, and I am a strong uh, proponent of this um, provision. We created a small business investment company in a bipartisan way decades ago. It's been one of the most successful programs created to spur business development in the country. Uh, it basically operates, uh, at, uh, operates on a, a sustainable level and doesn't cost the federal government uh, anything. We, it's like a, a venture capital, but not really like venture capital, it's like an investment, uh, not a bank, but a non-bank investment um, company that was created many, many years before I became chair of this committee, but it's been something that through Democratic and Republican administrations, because it works, we support. All this does is raise the statutory cap from $3 billion to $4 billion, and it increases the amount of leverage of licensees from $225 million to $350. They're bumping up against that $3 billion cap, very successful. We'd like to take it to the next level. 
And of course, some of the most successful funds within SBIC are bumping up against their $225 million cap per fund. So this was one of the great ideas that came out of our um, roundtable. And again, uh, not only does President Obama support it, it has my strong support and Senator Snow, the ranking member of small business. The next provision would be the SBA 504 refinancing. Uh, this extends for a year and a half the ability of the SBA 504 loan program. We talked about this. Senator Shaheen uh, spoke about this, and I've already explained it. So this is really the Isaacson, uh, Shaheen, and Snow proposal. The next is a small business lending activity index. This is something that I've uh, provided or, or put forward, and we've talked with the banks and SBA. They're all on board and accepting of this um, concept. It is a, um, a way to measure the small business lend lending activity that is being done at the city-state level um, through the 7A and 5, 504 loan uh, lending programs. It was very curious to me, Mr. President, when I became chair of this committee that we didn't have the measurements in place to actually judge whether some of our programs were really working or not, or were they working really well, or were they working moderately, or whether they were very weak. And so I've instructed you know, my staff, and we've been working uh, together, to see in every way if we can um, measure and really record the activities of the Small Business uh, Administration. It's only a billion dollar agency, one of the smaller agencies of the government, but that billion dollars comes from taxpayers and we want to make sure that money is spent uh, well and wisely. And so this legislation, again, at no cost, it can be done within the current budget, will be called the Lender Activity Index. It'll be posted on the SBA website. It'll have the name of the bank, the number of SBA loans made by each bank, the total dollar amount of SBA loans, the zip code of bank activity, uh, industries lent to, so we can sort of see how our banks are lending and to what uh, areas, the stage of the business cycle, and then whether it was a women-owned, minority-owned, or veteran-owned business, uh, if that information can be uh, obtained. Very simple. We made sure that the language uh, is easy for the banks. They already have to report this data. It's just not in a usable format, and this will require them to put it in a usable format. The um, next is um, access to global markets. Uh, this is what uh, Senator Shaheen uh, spoke about. So we have some, the major part of this bill are tax cuts to businesses. And then some oversight of the SBA, uh, tightening up, con you know, coordinating our export strategies. And then the next and final part of this, um, or next to last part of our amendment is basically access to mentoring education and strategic partnerships. Um, in our roundtable, I'm not going to go into all the details of, of these, uh, these items, but the bottom line is that in our roundtables, experts, both business owners and uh, the Kauffman Foundation and others came to us and said, Senator, you're right, businesses need capital. You're right, we need access to global markets. Um, you're right that we need a fair tax code, but what businesses also need is technical advice and support and training. And we need more education, entrepreneurship education. Now, the Small Business Administration is not the education agency, so we've been very careful not to um, mission creep. We have designed a couple of proposals that can encourage uh, uh, better activity within the SBA uh, to form partnerships with nonprofits and even for-profits, for not-for-profits, uh, and uh, schools uh, to promote entrepreneurship appropriately. The federal government can be a model. It's only one model, uh, but we believe that technical training uh, is important. Now, we have partners already established, the Women's Small Business uh, Centers um, and Minority Business Centers, and getting them to be more effective 
uh, and providing additional counseling is very important. And so finally, uh, on this amendment, access to government contracting is another method for small businesses to be able to grow. Governments, whether it's the federal government, state government, or local government, are huge purchasers of goods and services. And if our contracting laws are right, and if they are enforced, then small businesses in America have an opportunity to get started by competing for government contracts or to grow by receiving government contracts, and they're more likely to grow. If a big business gets a contract from the government, they can sometimes absorb that contract and make you know, their company more efficient, giving more work to the people that are already there, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, you know, that's business. But when a small business gets a government contract, it's most of the time results in additional hiring because small businesses have to be lean and agile. So they might have five people, but they have a lot of expertise. They land a contract from the government that they are most certainly qualified to do, and then they have to hire up. So they have to hire 10 people to carry out that contract, which is why I've been very supportive. Senator Cardin has been just a champion on this issue. Senator Levin as well, as giving small businesses an opportunity for contracting. And that will really, um, really help. So, Mr. President, in conclusion on this amendment, I see other members coming to the floor. I, I want to speak just for another uh, five or so minutes. So, in conclusion, I came to the floor today to support uh, the underlying bill, which is the Schumer uh, tax cut provision, which is targeted tax relief uh, to small businesses in America. I hope that our um, members will support that. If for any reason uh, they don't, uh, we don't support that, or even if we do, we'll still have an opportunity, I hope, to vote on the Landrieu Amendment. And I say that humbly because this amendment really has been put together by Senator Snow and her staff with me, members of the Small Business Committee on both sides of the aisle. We've picked up some great ideas, individual legislation that been, had been filed and had gotten unanimous uh, you know, consent and review talking to many people. So we don't believe that it's controversial. We know it doesn't cost that much, $4 billion, and we believe it will have a tremendous and immediate impact on small businesses um, in America. So I uh, wanted to give that explanation. We've received a tremendous amount of support to date from a variety of, of organizations. Uh, and I see my colleague on the floor, so I'll uh, yield uh, the floor at this time and perhaps be able to speak a few more minutes before 6 o'clock. Suggest the absence of a quorum. Mr. President. Ms. Does the senator withhold her request for a, a quorum call? Yes. Senator from Tennessee is recognized. Mr.